So in this episode of Insert Clickbait, we'll be covering how you can paint a realistic styled solar auxiliary army in less than a week. So welcome to the painting video for my solar auxiliar or lunar auxiliar, which I've used from that evil one's 3D printing range. I've also modified some, as you can see the Kettengrad and rapier carriages in the background, as well as weapons teams and bullpup las rifles across the army. I actually really recommend it, that range for dipping your toe into 3D editing in stuff like Mesh Mixer and 3D Builder. Now, we're gonna be attacking this army in about a week to finish it off. And I did actually finish it in a week because I need, I wanted to get some content out for basic humans and their arrival into Heresy 2. So as we go over into the fully painted section of the army, the colours that I chose were colours that would be very simple to apply. We could go through stages that would be very, very quick with effective colours that would have a good contrast. And also, I wanted some colours on there, such as this green you can see on the command squad and power axes, or orange that will be on the Volkites that will give the model some pop amongst all of the... I want to say realism, but it's not realism. It's just a gritty painting style, which I tend to favour. So this army actually took about a week to finish doing nights on the weekdays and approximately five, six hours on the weekends each day, which I don't think is too bad. There's 186 infantry models, 12 tanks, three flyers, five rapier teams, which are a bit unconventional, as well as three cyclops. So I was actually quite happy for getting them finished in that week. And I think it's a good painting method for anyone who's not got a lot of time, still wants to paint an army. If you like hard armies, it's really good. I think it's quite effective. I don't think you'll be winning painting awards with it, but what I do think is you will have a good looking army on the table very, very fast. And it doesn't have to use these colours. The methods can be used on pretty much any colours that you think. But I preferred this muted, realistic tone. These are the paints that we're going to be using today. There is one optional paint in there. And we'll get to that second, actually. The first is Surface Primer Black from Vallejo. Just blast it over all the models. It's cheaper than rattle cans. I actually prefer rattle cans. But when you're doing a big army, it can save quite a bit of money to use the surface primer. Just make sure to filter the surface primer sometimes so that it doesn't get lumps in your airbrush, which can make it a nightmare to work with. We've then got Vallejo Metal Colour Dark Aluminium, which I really like as a colour. I used Games Workshop's Lead Belcher in this video because I was sort of feeling, oh, I should probably not show I'm that lazy. But coming clean with it, I actually airbrushed a lot of the guns with metal coloured dark aluminium. So when you see that bit, that's an optional sub in. We're going to get use Tamiya German Grey, Deck Tan, Flat Earth and Flat Flesh, but that Flat Earth and Flat Flesh will be mixed into my dust mix. We've got Games Workshop Avalon and Sunset and Abaddon Black, which are used for the hazard stripes. Lead Belter, as I said before, for the guns as well as chipping on the armour. Got Old Copper and Intensity Violet from the Scale 75 range. AK's Engine Grime, which is just amazing as per. Pro Acryls Dark Red and Orange, which is going to be for a bit of highlights. We've also got Games Workshop's Death Corpse Drab for any uniforms that are on the models. We're then going to have the materials which are used in addition to the paint. That's I use Broken Toads brushes and I've listed the zero and the two which I believe are the ones that I used in this project but I just recommend using the biggest brushes you can get away with to do the job that you're currently doing on the model. We've then got a set of sponges, my Hadron Steinbreck Infinity 
some dirt for on the ground for basing materials along with PVA, some grass tufts which I got from a variety of places, some Vallejo Diorama texture paint which is the snow effect that I like, as well as leaf scatter which are just the sort of leaf seed pods that you can get from many suppliers. And I'll list all of those paints and materials again below so you can have a more permanent reference to what you may want for this type of project. So the first step is going to be with Tamiya German Grey in which we're going to cover the armour panels on the model. On these particular lunar auxilia, that's the helmet, the chest plates and the leg plates. So with that, I'm just doing a top-down angle. I mean, I hate the term zenithal highlighting because it's used as a catch-all, but that's essentially the best way to describe what we're doing in the simplest terms. And I'm being very liberal with this. It doesn't really matter about overspill at this point. In fact, it's probably just going to help the paint adhere to different locations on the model. Very much like pre-shading, but it's going to be the final finish or the final main colour base coat of this part of the model. So I'm just going to motor through the tent in the squad. You guys probably won't see everything. And it's just very liberally applying this because we'll darken it back down. I think you can actually see me over apply it to one's helmet right now. And it's going to be fine. We just keep moving through the models, cracking on, and we will repair it in the later stages. And that goes pretty much up until the last couple of stages on this entire paint job. Just do not worry about anything as you go along. And on to the next stage, which is the Tamiya Deck Tan. Now we're going to use this for all of the fatigues. And I'm taking a bit more care in how I apply it, like legs, arms, gloves. But I'm not worrying too much still. It's going to be overspraying at this stage. Don't worry about it. I actually went through a stage of panic during this stage. Like, oh my God, it's not going to come out right. It's not complicated enough, a shade through the model, it's too bright. Just keep going because when we get the enamel filter on top, it will darken it right down. It will cover all manner of sins and just getting through all of the models will have a quality all of its own. Like you don't want to go too insane when painting a hard army, do you? So yeah, as I say, just a bit more care. I don't want to overspray, but it's going to happen at some point. When you're trying to get all the way through so many models, it's just going to happen. So don't worry about it too much. Maybe take a little bit more care over this stage with your more centerpiece models. I didn't, and I don't think it actually mattered too much. You could do this with a brush. However, it's going to slow the process right down just putting new paint onto your brush all the time, those seconds add up, thinning down the paints, whereas just through an airbrush, a couple of cups of this colour will do the entire army, I found. And it's worth noting at this stage, I actually did this army a like almost a colour a night. So the first night I did all 200 models with the grey. The next night I did all 200 models with the deck tan and I just found it was a very simple way of going through the entire thing. It was a bit, it's a bit repetitive, but it cuts down on that time switching between colours if you paint squad by squad. And especially with such a fast method as we're doing, you can still see the progress every night. Right, I'm that much closer to finishing the entire thing. So this is it after the deck tan stage. And we're going to be moving into the basically optional choice between painting with lead belcher on a brush, which is what you see me doing here in the video. But that is a little bit of a lie because I actually airbrushed all of the guns on every model, ex on basically every bit of metal on the entire army except this one squad which I filmed was airbrushed with dark aluminium. And I was going to just say that I brush painted them with lead belcher. But at the end of the painting process, I couldn't actually tell the difference between the dark aluminium airbrushed ones and the brush painted lead belcher ones. 
which then led me to believe I should probably just come clean, tell the truth. There was no actual difference in the look of the models. So why not go for the faster option of the dark aluminium through an airbrush? Now with the brush, obviously you've got more control than on an airbrush, I would say on this sort of area, especially selecting the right brush. I just used a really rough brush for this, as you can see in the video, because I just wanted to knock these out. But you will have more control with the brush. However, with the airbrush, the overspill didn't really matter. It largely went onto armor plates that were in the next step are going to be chipped or in a couple of steps down the line. So what is the massive downside to an airbrush? Nothing I didn't find on this army. Even the bits that went onto the gloves, the enamel wash actually sort of stripped out the slight bit of metallic tinge on the, the clothing. So they no longer looked metallic and it didn't have any lasting effect really. So at this stage, it's looking pretty rough. We've got very hazy tones on everything. And honestly, you've just got to trust the process. We're gonna implement techniques that will make everything look better in post, essentially. So I'm gonna start now by adding visual interest to the model in the form of hazard stripes, because these are an auxilia to my Iron Warriors Legion. So I'm gonna have a rank stripe on the helmet as well as the shields that come on the Lunar Auxilia. Now, on other models, I picked uh, half of the breastplate that would indicate the companions to my Solar Auxilia Marshal and just various locations, but I kept it largely to this Avalon Sunset Hazard Stripe at the moment. And at this stage, it's stuff that we're going to be chipping next. Everything that isn't going to be chipped, I suppose except the fatigues because they were being airbrushed, but everything on the armor until now is stuff that it doesn't mind getting chipping on. Things like the red materials that will be on there won't get painted now. And massive shocker here, after the first stage of the hazard stripes are done, I'm going to go into the second stage. So obviously it's black. I like a bad and black or coal black by Pro Acryl. And I'm going to start on the helmet. I found it quite effective to black line either side of the hazard stripe area with the black color. So I do that on the helmet stripe, but I wouldn't do it on say shoulder pads or the shield that I'm going to do because it doesn't really need a border. So what I do is I angle the model so that when my brush stroke is pulled straight down, that puts the hazard stripe at 45 degrees to the running of the stripe. I then move down and try to keep a rhythm. I sometimes even move my brush before putting it on the model so that I get a rhythm built with when I'm placing the stripes. I'll then move down the model so that I try and get equidistant stripes along the model. If there are imperfections in your hazard stripes, on infantry especially, don't worry at this sort of stage. We're about to go into the chipping and it will hide, as I said, all manner of shames. And that's what we're going to do right now. So I take lead belcher because it's a thicker paint rather than having the option of dull aluminium or dark aluminium before and I use a sponge, a small piece. You can either use it in between your fingers or get a set of tweezers, which I find has a little bit more control, but I always seem to end up using my, like just holding it in my fingers. So I'm gonna go for the edges of the armor plates. I'm gonna go for the hazard stripes, particularly where I messed them up. And I'm just going to add some silver weathering. I'm not gonna do streaks like I sometimes do on vehicles, which I'm just gonna go straight up and down onto the model in a random pattern and turning the sponge so that it's not always the same area of the sponge that gets onto the model. Now that's not as important on these models across an entire army, but when you have a singular model with 
lots of surface that is going to be chipped, you definitely want to be turning your foam very frequently, just so it's not the same pattern of foam bubbles that hits the model at each point. And in the same vein, turn your model as well as the foam and it just gets it to be completely random. So with this as well, I've taken a bit of paint on my painting desk because I don't really use a palette when I'm speed painting like this. And I'll just stamp it onto the palette to get some of the paint off, not loads. I find like the advice to like take most of the paint off never seems to work. Take a little bit of the paint off so you're not splashing the model with paint. And then just keep going with the chipping for as long as you want until you feel it's enough on your model. Now, I didn't do this here in the name of expediency, but there's nothing stopping you doing some chipping on a model, putting it down, and then coming back do I, and thinking, do I need more on this model with a set of fresh eyes? So if you're not as pressed for time as I was, it's something I definitely recommend doing. So next on the menu is to pick out all of the colors, like fabrics, or pipes, things like that, that didn't want to get affected by chipping before. So on that, I've got the sashes that were on my sergeants, the fatigues that are at the back of the squads at ease, some pipes on the back of, say, the Vox operator, and things like that, just more organic details rather than things that have got metallic underlays. So we'll just speed through me picking them out. I've used here Burnt Red by Pro Acryl because I've, I really like Burnt Red by Pro Acryl. And I've used Death Corpse Drab for the fatigues because I wanted that sort of khaki look. So I've really got to admit my bum was flapping at this point in the week. I was two, three days in and they were looking ridiculous and terrible but as I have always sort of stuck to since I've been told it trust the process keep moving and crack on with it basically so I did just that I grabbed my AK engine grime and started applying a filter over all the models now it wasn't going on too thickly just because of a quirk of the the quirk of airbrushing so I ended up doing like two coats on these, but you want a nice thick base coat across the entire model, covering up and ruining everything that you've done before. But don't worry, because we will be removing a lot of that and using it as just a filter across the model. Now, I imagine you can do this with a brush as well, but I prefer airbrushing it for both speed, even coverage, and just ease of doing it. So... I was wearing gloves to protect my hands because this is pretty nasty paint to be going through the airbrush. Make sure you're doing it in a well-ventilated area. But moving on from the necessary safety spiel, this step is going to set us up with a nice matte colour. It's going to mute down and stain all of the colours underneath. So that deck tan that is currently appearing luminescently bright is going to be really matted down and darkened down and brought into the style of colour that we're really after for this gritty style of model. And it's worth noting that overly bright colours actually make this step work better. So if you were choosing a different palette of colours to use for doing something like this, Go a shade brighter than you actually want for your models because this will darken it down, as I said, and you'll end up with something too dark if you don't up the brightness in the stages before. So here we have a dried, fully coated, um, engine grimed model. And I'm going to start going at this with a cotton board filled with white spirit. And I'm going to start rubbing basically the top edges of all the models. So it's going to leave the engine grime in a lot of the cracks. And it's also going to have stained the paint underneath. Now, you can do this after a, a couple of days. I've not left it more than three days before. 
but I tend to go straight into this step after spraying the models. I did the entire batch of the army, so there was the space of me spraying 200 models in there. But it looks quite good, be quite liberal. It will take off. Basically, the model will now appear slightly brighter than it ends up during this step. So as you activate the an engine grime, it will look brighter than it will actually end up. So you've yet again got to remind yourself to trust in the process, go through the steps. And as you're doing it, you're trying to activate the majority of the engine grime that's on there. Get it wet like you've been applying an oil paint. Um, it doesn't want to be completely running across the model. But I'm not thinking about it too much. I'm explaining this like I'm. it's in my head as I'm doing it. But basically I'm rubbing the, a Q-tip with white spirit on across the model. You want this sort of filter and to use it as a gradient shade across the areas that you're leaving stain on. So the deck tan areas are going to end up with this shaded filter across it. And because you've built the deck tan on there with an airbrush already, it will already be slightly shaded across the surface. So this will add just an extra layer of gradient across the area and every other area that you've applied it to. And one thing I will say now is that if you wanted to leave the model directly after this step, you probably could do. It looks 90% there. And what we're going to do after is more post-production sort of stuff. It, it's not too much effort, so I recommend doing it. But you've already got the majority of the stuff painted. You could e very easily put this on the table with how it looks after the white spirit here dries. And you're going to see me now actually taking off some additional engine grime on the head of the sergeant because I wanted that plume and hazard stripes to be sort of extra bright and extra stand out when it's on the tabletop so I can easily identify which model is the sergeant. Next step is my dust or dirt mixture. Now this is one of my favourite steps. I use it on pretty much every model I ever paint nowadays and have done for possibly the last seven years. This is a mixture of Tamiya Flat Earth and Flat Flesh. And I'm going to apply it around the feet, bottoms of the coats. If I've got more time, I apply this to sort of knees and elbows specifically. Anywhere that a model would get mud on their clothing and then that odd armour and then that mud would have dried. And this is a 50-50 mix. I don't think I mentioned that at the start. Um, I pre-mix it then with another 50% thinner and whack it in the pot because I use it just so, so much. And I'm quite liberal with it. It's very hard to put too much on. Like I do one, two, three passes sometimes across the model. And it gives that another tone shift and shading shift gradient on the model that makes it look like you've done so much more than you actually have for the amount of effort that this stage is. And it adds that dustiness that realistic paint jobs come with. And when you see soldiers on deployment, they're always really dusty. And this gives them that realistic look. Next, we're gonna start adding interest to the weapons that are up to now have only been silver. We're gonna do this with Ink Intensity Violet and I'm going to be spraying the end of the gun with the colour so that there is a gradient from at the end of the gun, it's very strong violet, and further away it's weaker. Now if you wanted to add more interest to this and com like sort of complication to this, you could start off with, a, I like wood for basic heat weapons, which I imagine being melter, flamer, volkite even. And I do this with intensity wood sprayed further up than I would spray the purple. That gives like a nice charred looking base. Then the purple as there is a heat distortion on the metal. And then finally a Tamiya flat black end to give that real dark core carbon looking deposit at the end of the rifle. Next is the heat within the gun. 
and I'm going to do that with this Pro Acryl Orange actually through the airbrush. And I'm just gonna spray that onto the heat coils. You could further enhance this with some yellow, but I felt the Pro Acryl Orange was enough for what I was trying to achieve with the models. On other models in the army, I've done the same sort of effect with a bright green being Games Workshop Moot Green on the power axes in the Velotaris squads as well as doing it on optics with green because it's a nice stark contrast to the dark hues of the model. Now, in that, I've picked both a warm and a cold colour. The orange being the warm colour where I'd put like the heat and then the cold colour tying in with like sort of sci-fi computer screen looks. And what you've just seen there is me really mess up the amount of uh, orange that I wanted on that gun. So what I do is I straight away grab a brush because I've had enamel paints on it already. Um, I choose a, a brush that I would normally use with oil paints that I wouldn't use for any other paint. I whack it in with some water and just scrub off the bit of the orange that I don't like and then start again. It's, it's not a worry. You've not got to worry too much about this. Stuff happens and you can fix these things. It's not too, it's not going to ruin the entire army's look if there's a bit of overspray on one model. In fact, I'm gonna go for overspray on some of the arms, armor pieces that are right next to these heat sources and light sources in order to add that bit of object source lighting to them in a very simple fashion. Now, here are some examples of the greens which I've used, which I've used on the close combat weapons, stuff that's AP2 gonna scare people basically. Um, also on my psychers, which fingers crossed Solar will get some access to psychers in 2.0. And as I say, I've just used this as an OSL source of lighting through an airbrush, kept it very thin, multiple coats, especially with the OSL rather than onto the weapons. The weapons you can be a bit more liberal but on the psychers as well, I did mess up and just used a brush to wash off the excess. So still don't panic too much about this step. So next is the basing in which I'm going to take my dirt, which I got from my garden and dried out next to a radiator, just ambiently over time. And I'm going to mix it with PVA until it's to a level I can easily paint onto the base whilst maintaining some structure to the dirt PVA mix. Now, I've chosen this because I wanted a sort of moorland style base to the model, which I'm probably going to be rebasing all my Iron Warriors in as well because I quite like how it looks. So I've used this for the base layer because I decided on what looks more like dirt than dirt. So I dried it out, sieved it down so that it was at the right sort of sizes for the models. And yet, I'm just going to apply it to the base with a paintbrush because I never found anything better for painting onto the base with than a paintbrush. I tried coffee stirrers and it was all so much harder than just grabbing an old paintbrush and applying it on. Now, I'd recommend painting these in batches of 10 to 20 so that you've still got some, so that the PVA is still wet when you're going to be applying the grass tufts, which will come next. And that's because I've never found the self-adhesive grass tufts stick really well to bases normally. I find I need that additional adhesion from doing it at this stage and it adhering with the PVA to keep them on the bases. So I'm now gonna talk in some generalities rather than specifics and then I'll sort of narrow down into exactly what I did. So my general recommendation for basing is to have your base cover, which in my case is the dirt. You could also do it with like a sand or anything like that. Then I would have like sort of the topper, which in my case are these plants. And I would array the toppers across your desk in a palette. And you want to get these palettes and like maybe keep a note of them so you can replicate it across your army if you're doing them at different stages. But yeah, create a palette of colours, things that are appropriate for the location in which you're going to be basing in. And then you can choose at random, because landscapes are 
well, I was going to say random, but I'm a landscape architect, so I probably shouldn't say landscapes are random. The landscapes on your bases are going to be random because you're not modeling the entire landscape. So, yeah, select your palette, get a varying height to go on there. Like I've chosen everything between two millimeter and I believe it was 12 millimeters high. The one that I actually most like out of all of them is not, I like the wildflowers for adding color. I try and use a lot of grasses on these bases in particular, especially in the winter colors, which are more like sort of yellowy and browns. But the one that I most like is actually the model tree shops bracken that you can see on this model's base now. And that's because it's a nice heather color. It goes with the moorland theme that I was trying to get. Um, and yeah, I really recommend that as a ground cover because you can put it as a nice texture on quite a lot of the base without being too dominating of the base that you can then add little bits to of vivid color from where you want. Next, we're gonna go on to the final stage of basing, which for me was using Tamiya Diorama texture paint with the snow effect. And be careful not to get the powder snow effect. Uh, the grains are a lot smaller. I prefer this one. Or be careful to get the one you want is essentially what I'm saying. The amount of times which I've accidentally bought the powder snow effect, meaning to buy this, is too many to count. So I'm gonna apply this onto the model, onto the base, just in the quantities which I, I like, you know? Um, try and keep it, I try and think of putting it in the shadows of plants, of areas, but really on bases this small, it's just going to go on until it stops looking nice. I also wipe some in the grasses and flowers because that gives sort of a 3D effect and looks like it's caught on those strands of grass and flowers, as you see in the winter time, rather than just being on the base of the model. And I find it adds just that little bit of realism over just putting it on the actual base layer. Now, canny viewers may notice that I've actually shown you this step out of order. I actually went and played a game of Heresy 1 in between these two steps at one of the mornings. So this is the black lining step around the base that will just finish the model. However, I did this before the texture paint that you've just seen because I wanted to go and play a game with them as fast as possible, even though it wasn't currently out in the 2.0 system. So I found Alim, who has been on the channel with his World Eaters, was well up for playing a game of Heresy regardless of form. And yeah, we played a game of Heresy 1 so that I could use my Solar Exilia. So massive thanks to him. And with that, with this base, this is sort of coming to a close. We've got one more step that I actually did on these models, which we'll get onto momentarily. So the final step is less a painting stage and more something else that took up time within that week. And it's something to make the army more playable. With 200 plus models in the army, because it will be more now with the reviews that I've just seen halfway through editing this video uh, for what Solar are going to be like, it's going to be a lot of models and I wanted something to take the stress away of moving about those models in the movement phase and with reactions every turn. So it was movement trays. So what did I want out of a movement tray? I wanted something that was really discreet, something that wasn't going to basically hinder what the look of the model was. I didn't want this big chunky movement tray around it like I had on some militia stuff. So that came down to these mini mag trays, which I'd seen my friend Chris Legg using, and it's just on the bottom of the tray magnetized. And to be honest, I quite like them. I've used them now and tested them out. I like them, so I will link them below. And with that, that is the end of the painting guide. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. You can see some images of how else I've applied these techniques to the infantry in the army as I speak. I'll also be doing a vehicle video as well as 
basically just showing off the army in the next week. I'm going to do a army showcase, which I didn't think anyone would be interested in, but I've had a, a couple of requests to do army showcases on the channel. So I'll attempt to do that. And if you liked this painting video, if you want to see more of them, don't forget to like, comment on the video what you liked. What can I improve about these painting videos? Because I need to improve them so that they're actually better than they are now. Um, if you really like the channel, there is a Patreon link below as well as a link to the War Office where you can get 30% off all new releases and 25% off other than that of Games Workshop products. They also have the Geek Gaming Scenic range, which some of the tufts I used in the video today are from there as well as other paint products. I think pretty much everything but the Pro Acryl paints, the two Pro Acryl crates that I used can be got from the War Office. So with that, Thank you very much for watching and I will catch you on the vehicle video, on the army showcase or on the battle reports. See you in a bit.